This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. EPL Match Week 3 is just around the corner, and it is our time to see if we can get Austin Cass to cool off, because he is 4-0 so far in EPL picks here for the show, but as always, it's not sustainable to do that stuff, so we're going to set realistic expectations for Austin, but then also still pick his brain and hope he can get to 6-0 and for this week. We're going to talk EPL Match Week number 3, talk some NASCAR at Daytona, and Formula One in the Netherlands. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a digital media managing editor for FanDuel Research. Joined here, as mentioned by Austin Cass. You can check him out on Twitter at Austin Cass. He is a senior editor for FanDuel Research. Austin, again, 4-0 to open this year. So kudos to you on that. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. It's great to have you here. And, you know, hot start so far, but we're going to keep real, we're going to keep expectations in check. And, uh, but I got to know before we get into things, how are you feeling about uh, match week number three? Uh, yeah, I'm really excited. Uh, it feels like these first two weeks have flown by, but yeah, everything's been great on my end betting wise, which it's, it's hard to just enjoy it when it's right. good and not think about, well, that probably means I'm going to have right. some bad weekends, but. Yeah, the first two weeks have been really fun. Yeah, it's important to keep in mind that we go through streaks, good and bad. And it's important to not get, uh, not totally abandon your process when things go poorly and not get overconfident when things get too good. So we're going to talk about Austin, talk to Austin about match week three, dig into a uh, big match in the slate and get you ready for all that here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcast. We broke down college football week zero with Dr. Ed Fang yesterday here on the show. Got his thoughts on Notre Dame Navy, talked other week zero games and a Heisman bet that Ed likes right now as well. You can find that by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find it up on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV Plus. And FanDuel TV Plus now available on desktop and mobile by going to FanDuel.com slash watch. So no longer just available on uh, Apple, uh, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, or Roku. You can now find it on uh, online by going to FanDuel.com slash watch. Log in with your FanDuel account to stream FanDuel TV, watch Up and Adams, and also check out the solo shot and covering the spread. Let's dig in now to match week number three, Austin. The headline match this weekend is Newcastle hosting Liverpool. Newcastle, um, slight favorites in this game, but it does seem like it's a pretty tightly contested matchup here. Newcastle's money line is plus 115 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Liverpool plus 200 and a draw is plus 280. So I want to get your initial thoughts on this match. Uh, What do you see going down in this big headliner on Sunday? So we've uh, ridden with Newcastle a few times over the past year plus, and I'm going to stick with them. Um, I'm on them, uh, their money line at plus 115. It should be a really fun match, but I think Newcastle are the better side. And once you factor in the home field advantage, I really like getting Newcastle at plus money. Uh, going by FB refs expected goal model, Newcastle was a good bit better than Liverpool last season. Newcastle's XG differential was plus 32.4 and Liverpool's was uh, plus 21.7. Newcastle was really, really good at home a year ago. They had the EPL's second best home XG differential at plus 27.7 and gave up just 14 goals in 19 home matches. So far this year, it's just two weeks, but Newcastle have pretty much been uh, the same team they were last year. And they've been better than Liverpool have been. Uh, Newcastle played at home versus Villa in a match where we cashed a bet on them and they've played at City. Against Villa, they amassed 3.3 XG and won 5-1. to one. And Then they put up a pretty good fight at City last week, uh, kept the defending champs to just 1.0 XG. The last time City was held to 1 XG or less in a home match was back in 2022 versus Chelsea. So Newcastle struggled and attacked that match and barely generated anything, but defensively they showed that they have what it takes to hold one of the best teams in Europe in check. So... I think Newcastle is one of the best teams in the Premier League. I think they're going to take all three points against the Liverpool side. That's still a work in progress, especially in midfield. So I like the chance to get Newcastle at plus 115. Yeah, that's in the money line for Newcastle to win in this match. Plus 115 in the bet or the the market where there is a draw included. So Newcastle plus 115 there. You're not, now you talked about Newcastle having 
a bit of a larger home field than other teams may have. How much stock do you put into that? Because we know that home field can be bigger for some teams versus others. And how much does that matter for you, knowing that some teams might get more juice? You know, how much of a factor is that for you, given that the dimensions in soccer for every stadium are going to be the exact same? Yeah, so soccer fields are actually different sizes. Oh, it's it's similar to baseball. There's like certain guidelines that have to be within, but the, yeah. the width of the pitch can be different. So there's some really big fields. Like the playing the regulation, like the regulation yes. size can be different? That's yeah, crazy. Just, okay. Just wow, like I how a baseball field can be with the outfield fences. So yeah, some teams, I think Selhurst Park or Crystal Palace uh, plays is a smaller field. Uh, Old Trafford where Maine United plays is a much bigger field. Uh-huh. Anfield or Liverpool plays is a really small field, but just in terms of size of like seating capacity, Newcastle is one of the bigger in the league and they really have a raucous crowd. I would, I don't know what really to compare it to because they're a team, they're a big club in England for sure. One of the biggest, but they've really struggled the last like 20 years and mm-hmm. the fan base knows they've got it back now. They've got new ownership as well. That's got a lot of money to spend. So they're probably the happiest fan base in the league outside of Man City's fan base. So they've made that St. James Park a real fortress. And it's difficult to know how much to factor that in with betting. For me, I just feel like Newcastle has been undervalued for like 12 months now. I think we've talked about them in in match week one, maybe where, uh, it just feels like on paper they shouldn't be this good and that they're yeah. overachieving, but the sample's large enough now that it seems like they're really this good. And and Liverpool's super volatile team, they probably should be better on paper than what they have been, but the pieces just don't fit well right now. And I think when you factor all that together, plus the home field advantage, I really like the chance to get Newcastle at plus money. I feel enlightened now. Did not know that they could have different size pitches. So uh, this is this is why you're the EPL expert. And I'm just here asking the questions. Apparently asking them incorrectly. But hey, I feel a lot smarter now. So we're on Newcastle plus 115, taking on Liverpool on Sunday. But Austin, there are a bunch of other matches, nine other matches across match week number three. Where else do you see value right now over at FanDuel? Um, I see some value with Manchester City in their match. Uh against Sheffield United. I like City to go over two and a half goals, um, which was plus 100 last I checked. City have won uh, both of their matches so far, but really haven't been at their scintillating best in attack. Um, They failed to tally 2.0 XG in either match. Um, I think we see their high-flying attack come back on Sunday morning against Sheffield United. We've touched on Sheffield United already. Uh, they came into the year looking like a side that was destined to get relegated. They've done nothing through two weeks to make odds makers or me think otherwise. They're priced at minus 240 to be relegated. They've lost the XG battle 1.9 to 0.5 and 1.4 to 0.5 through two matches with Crystal Palace and Nottingham Forest. Palace and Forest are likely to finish at best in the bottom half of the table and maybe in like the bottom six or seven. So Sheffield United were overmatched in those fixtures. They're going to be in a lot of trouble against Man City on Sunday. So City are 600 to win, uh, minus 600 to win, which I'm not touching. I'm somewhat interested in City's first half money line price of minus 180, especially if 10 or 15 minutes go by and you can live bet it and that number drops. But I think the best route uh, before the match to get exposure to City is the plus 100 on over two and a half goals. Yeah, as you mentioned, that's even money for City to score uh, over two and a half goals. It is currently a FanDuel Sportsbook. If you go to the goals tab, away team over under two and a half goals, even money on the over is what you can find right now. Now, again, I'm asking you to educate me. This is just my crash course, uh, having you illustrate everything for me. When I have a, t- a mismatch like this in other sports, I worry sometimes that a team will take their foot off the gas pedal. Now, scoring three goals may not account, may not be that. Um, but like the concern is, do they need to go all out in this kind of game? So, how much does goal differential matter when it's not against a team that you're expecting to be anywhere near in the table towards the end of the year? Does it matter to like this overall goal differential matter for a team like Man City? Or how does that dynamic play out when it's such a lopsided matchup at this point in the year? Yeah, it's a great question. So, 
it can matter if at the end of the season Man City was tied with, say, Arsenal on points, then the champion would be awarded based on goal differential. It's obviously unlikely that they would tie on points and that that would factor in, but it, it is somewhat of a factor. With City, they're just really ruthless. Um, in the first match of the year, they were playing at Burnley, which is a side that's just been promoted. City has is coming off winning the treble. Um I, I think if anything, there would be maybe some fear that City just in general would let their foot off the gas this year. Going into halftime, they were up by multiple goals. I think it was 2-0, but maybe it was 3-0. And Erling Holland and Pep Guardiola, their manager and their star striker, got into an argument coming off the field at halftime because Holland wasn't doing what Pep wanted him to do. And that's just the culture that City have. Like, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, if you remember in Alabama, in the national yeah. championship game against Notre Dame. Yeah. I think it was McCarron in the center got in an argument when they were just throttling him. That's <laughs> just how they are. And Holland is just starved for goals. It, I don't think it matters what the score is that he will, he wants to score more. So it's it's somewhat of a fair comment. If they're up 2-0 late in the game, they might just pass it around a little bit. Sure. And Sheffield and I had to chase him around. But for the most part, these top teams just want to score and they just want to keep scoring. And they are capable of doing so, too. The Aston Villa one you had last week, uh, it was over one and a half goals, and they did that in the 24th minute. So hopefully we can get the Man City one. 24th minute might be greedy for over two and a half goals, but you never know. We'll see how things play out for them on uh, for their match. That is on Saturday or Sunday for that I one. I think it's Sunday at nine. Yeah, Eastern. so both on Sunday for the Man City one. Over two and a half goals at uh, even money. And then also the Newcastle money line at plus 115. That is Austin Cass. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Austin Cass. Find his work over at FanDuel Research Austin. I know, again, we're not going to set expectations too high. We want to be realistic here. But good luck to you, BPL bets across this upcoming week. And uh, we'll talk to you again in the very near future. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim. All righty. Again, find Austin on Twitter at Austin Cass uh, to get all of his work over at FanDuel Research. We're going to dive in, talk some NASCAR at Daytona and Formula One in the Netherlands here in just one second. But first, get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book right now. New customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can be on everything from spreads, player props, and more. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9-WIPIT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700, visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana, visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia, call 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Help is here, visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. Call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text OPEN-Y in New York. NFL Sunday ticket offers offer ends 9-18-23. No refunds. Terms and embargoes apply. $100 off NFL Sunday ticket, not YouTube TV. YouTube TV base plan required to watch YouTube TV. Redemption requires a Google account and current form of payment. Commercial use is excluded. Now it's time to talk some racing for this weekend. Didn't have time to run my Xfinity simulations before today. We'll post those up on FanDuel Research later on. Those, if you want some thoughts on Xfinity at Daytona or the Truck Series at Milwaukee, check those out on FanDuel Research later on this weekend. But let's begin things by talking about some NASCAR at Daytona. It is the final race of the regular season this week, uh, which means that we got a lot of desperation. Chase Elliott, the favorite at FanDuel Sportsbook, he is uh, eleven to one. So. Things pretty spread out there. 
I do think it's worth considering motivation for this week because some drivers have extra motivation to win. Some drivers have motivation to aid teammates. You know, Kyle Larson, if he were to actually finish a restrictor play race, uh, would probably be helping Chase Elliott or Alex Bowman. Um, Danny Hamlin has said he wants to push Bubba Wallace to a win to get the 2311 team into the owner's uh, playoffs as well. So like motivation does matter a bit. And I think that the two bets I like most this week over at FanDuel Sportsbook do properly account for that. Let's begin with the more fun one. That is an outright on a guy who is currently pretty far outside the playoff uh, discussion and will need a win in order to advance the playoffs. That guy is Eric Jones, who is 35 to one at FanDuel Sportsbook. The implied odds there are 2.8%. I have Jones at 3.2%. It's not a huge edge there, but I do agree with what the model is saying and that Jones may be undervalued here. Jones is a past Daytona winner. Of course, that was back in his days with Joe Gibbs Racing. So it's been a while, but ever since they switched to the next gen car, we've seen Jones be very competitive on pack tracks. They've run 10 races in the next gen era with this car and Jones has finished inside the top six in four of those races in Talladega last spring. He was leading on the final lap uh, before getting shuffled back to six. I had him at 70 to one for that race. So, oh, well, move on to the next one. But I think it to me, it does show despite the fact he has not won here in a while. He does have the upside to do so even in this new car. Of course, Legacy's cars this year are not as good, but even this year he had an eighth place finish in Atlanta where he went from like 20th to eighth in one lap. I had a top 10 bet on him for that race, so that was great. And in Talladega this year, finished sixth once again. Daytona probably going to be a bit of a wreck fest. It tends to be that. So we got the desperation factor. It is warmer during the summer, which factors into that as well. So I think a lot of factors align to make a team like Legacy capable of winning for this week. His teammate Josh Berry is not eligible for the playoffs, so no motivation for him to win for himself. Legacy's in a weird spot where they will not get help from Chevy because they're switching to Toyota next year, so kind of a, a lone ranger out there. But I do think Jones makes a lot of sense, 35-1 to as a win bet for this week, all things considered. So Eric Jones, a guy I've been on for most pack tracks recently, Back on him once again for this week, 35 to one at FanDuel Sportsbook. Other bet is a podium bet. And I do show value on Kevin Harvick to win this race. So you could consider him. He's 30 to one at FanDuel. I think you can get as long as like 45, some other spots. So maybe if you can get that longer than 30 on Harvick, I took him 35 to one personally, got that somewhere else, but 30 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Not quite long enough. I'd rather go with the podium bet on Harvick if I'm going to get him at 10 to 1. And there is value there for me, too. Actually, a little bit better value. I have Harvick at 11.2% to podium versus 9.1% implied at FanDuel Sportsbook at 10 to 1. So the data aligns here, but also anecdotally, because Harvick is the lone Stuart Haas racing car locked into the playoffs right now which means Eric Almarola, Chase Briscoe, and Ryan Priest are all going to need help in order to get a win and get another SHR car into the playoffs. Now, would Harvick give up a win in his final race at Daytona as a full-time driver to help a teammate win? I would hope not. Um, Harvick won the only or the, the first NASCAR Cup Series race I went to, the 2007 Daytona 500, so... He can win here, and I hope that he actually like is selfish and tries to win this race because it's a better story, it's more fun, and uh, I'd rather see him win. So I don't know if he'd push them to a win, but there's always that concern. And you could also have concern about Harvick's upside because he has not been good on these tracks during the next-gen era. No finish is better than 10th. He's had, like in Atlanta this year, had a really weird like brain fart and wrecked himself in Denny, Denny Hamlin, so... I think age is showing for Harvick and maybe you're concerned he can't win, but you get two additional spots in the podium bet. So that's, that's beneficial there. I think that that leeway does matter a bit. So I think the podium bet is better for Harvick than for, than the outright. He has been running well in these races. He's had a uh, top 15 average running position in seven out of 10 races. So does run towards the front. He doesn't need points this week because he's already, I guess he does in terms of like, you know, uh, in terms of playoff points and stuff like that. But I think he has motivation to win and motivation to help his teammates. And both those do work well for a podium bet. So Harvick at 10 to one to podium, 
my preferred market for him again if you can get 35 or longer on the outrights maybe that's the better way to go for harvick but with where things stand right now i'd rather go 10 to 1 to podium instead of 30 to 1 to win for harvick so the two nascar bets i like for daytona eric jones 35 to 1 and kevin harvick at 10 to 1 let's finish up here by talking about some formula one in the netherlands coming off of a very long summer break. It always feels like the summer break for Formula One is excruciating, but they are back this week. And sounds like Mercedes will have some upgrades for this week. I'm not going to bet them to win because I don't show value on that uh, because it is very hard to make a team to get a team to top Red Bull in the model right now. So not going there, not seeing a lot of value in Red Bull either. So I'm going to avoid outrights for this week. Instead, I want to dip a bit lower in the order and talk about some markets down there. The two bets that I like most for this week are Carlos Sainz to finish inside the top six at plus 115 and Daniel Ricciardo to finish inside the top 10 at plus 410. Starting with the top 10 market or the top six market, Sainz is plus 115. His teammate, Charles Leclerc, is minus 250 here. And of course, you also have the McLaren cars. Lando Norris is minus 440 and Oscar Piastri is minus 250. I think the level of confidence in ranking all those drivers above signs is a bit misplaced. I have signs at 50% to finish inside the top six. His implied odds are 46.5%. Obviously, the reason we're getting this discount on signs, quote unquote discount, is because of the emergence of McLaren, which means we have two Red Bulls, two Mercedes, uh, two McLarens and two Ferraris fighting for the top six. Maybe you put Aston Martin in there, but I've got uh, both signs and Leclerc ahead of both Aston Martins right now. If we zero in on just the four races since McLaren had their big upgrade, so three races for Lando Norris and or four races for Norris, three for Oscar Piastri, signs in those races has finished sixth, tenth, eighth, and nineteenth. So just one top six in that time, and no, no finish is better than sixth. But before he had an incident during the race at Spa, so looking at the weekend, the sprints and stuff like that, Sainz did have pretty good speed there, just had an issue during the race. Leclerc finished third in that one, so I feel like Ferrari does still have speed, and it's good enough speed to keep them at least in contention with McLaren. Leclerc, again, is ahead of Sainz, so that does matter, but... I have signs ahead of both, both Aston Martin cars and honestly not that far behind the two McLarens. I feel like this is a full tier here of Norris, Piastri, Leclerc, and signs. Maybe put George Russell in that tier as well as being all guys kind of grouped together who have somewhat similar expectations for finishes uh, for this weekend. So getting signs at plus 115 at the bottom end of that tier to me is pretty enticing. There is risk here, obviously, because, you know, it's, also 50% to lose based on my model, but it is a value. So I've got signs are on even money for a top six his implied odds or his odds right now are plus 115. So I'll take that discount and take signs to finish inside the top six for this weekend. As mentioned, the other bet is on Ricardo to finish inside the top 10. And you may be groaning given I was pretty high on Ricardo heading into spa. He, had a lap to lead during qualifying, qualified 19th, and I believe finished 16th during this race. Never really got close to finishing inside the points, but the speed was still okay. And obviously, I have the prior that I began with the year with on Ricardo still in my model, because we've only had two races on him. That prior was pretty low. I had him below Yuki Tsunoda for my prior because wasn't great at McLaren, hadn't driven the car all year. I thought there might be a kind of ramp up period for Ricardo. So that low prior is still in there for Ricardo. But when you factor in the speed that he showed the past two races, it's pretty good. Uh, looking at Ricardo, he had similar speed to Yuki in uh, Spa, despite starting 19th. So racing behind some slower cars, still pretty good speed there. And Yuki finished inside the points there. And Ricardo had much better speed than Sonoda in his first race back. And he just got put in a hole in both those races. Had an incident that was not his own doing in the first race, and then uh, had the lap lead, which was his fault, uh, in Spa. And that could happen again, for sure. But he hasn't had the time to recover from those incidents. If he can have a clean weekend, I think that Ricardo is definitely a pretty good shot to finish inside the points. I think the speed is there, and that's the, the big factor here. So 
Hopefully, Ricardo has had more time to get comfortable with this car. Hopefully, that allows us to avoid the mistakes like the uh, like the the lap completion that he had back in Spa. I do think the model that I have is too high on Ricardo right now, but I also think the mo- that the market is too low. Ricardo's implied odds for a top ten at uh, plus four ten are nineteen point six percent. I've got him pretty well clear of that, so. I'm okay going with Ricardo plus 410, despite the fact it did not work out this past week. Like looking at the the top 10 odds, Ricardo well behind Sonoda. I don't think that should be the case based on these first two races. He's well behind the two Alfa Romeo cars as well. You know, I don't think that should be the case. So Daniel Ricardo plus 410 for a top 10 and Carlos Sainz plus 115 for a top six. The two bets I like most for this weekend in Formula One. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread, but we are back with you once again tomorrow in a JJ Zacharyson on of LateRound.com to talk about his favorite season-long player props for this year and also talk about his process for making projections, finding players who can outperform projections, and much more. So find that on the Covering the Spread podcast feed along with our Week Zero College Football Preview, wherever you get your podcasts, and FanDuel TV. Uh, FanDuel TV Plus and the FanDuel YouTube page as well. Big thank you once again to Austin Cass. Check him out on Twitter at Austin Cass. Find his work over at FanDuel Research. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow FanDuel Research at FanDuel Research. want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across tonight. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow, talking some player props with JJ. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 